I was very recently product leader at Next Big Sound, which is a small startup that Pandora acquired uh, about two years ago. I started four years ago at Next Big Sound. I was on kind of like UX and design 95% of the time and 5% of the time I was doing product, thinking, research, that sort of thing. And over those four years, you know, the amount of product work I was doing went up and up and up and up and the design went down and down and down and down until all I was doing was product management work. Um, I want to extend a sincere apology to anybody who was expecting David Hoffman to be here, if anybody's friend or colleague of David Hoffman. I'm not David Hoffman. We're close with David Hoffman at uh, Next Big Sound. So while I was there, of course, especially in the last two years when I was doing a lot of product leadership, I was responsible for making sure that everybody you know, who was working at Next Big Sound knew kind of like what they were working on and why they were working on it. Now, anybody who's kind of like worked in team before, which I'm going to assume is pretty much anybody here, knows that getting people to work together, kind of aimed in the same direction, is really tough. It's not easy. You know, product, doing the product work, doing the design work, doing the dev work, it's tough enough. But doing people work, so much harder. And that's why I actually like got into it and get excited about it because it's a you know, huge challenge that's like fresh, right, every day to help people kind of like reorient themselves no matter what commit they're working on or what design project they're working on and make sure everybody's kind of like marching together as one towards some kind of, you know, objective, right? So I'm going to kind of like walk you through uh, some tools, you know, and some habits that we had at Next Big Sound that kind of like helped us get to you know, a good place, what we're working on, you know, in terms of our product team on a, like a daily, weekly, monthly, quarterly, yearly basis. And it all comes to, you know, creating context, you know, for the team. And as somebody who's like contributing in that way, you know, they should be really invested in making sure that that unit of work that they're doing, you know, they're doing it as well as they can. But when you get in the weeds sometimes, you know, you kind of forget about the greater context about like where the whole company is going, right? Or even like your smaller team. And that's where, you know, like product leadership comes in to help kind of like create that context and then like reinforce it too to make sure that people always have that kind of like in the back of their minds or they have quick reference to it when they need to know so that work stays on kind of like a good course moving forward, not a lot of like swirl or like, you know, wasted time, any of that good stuff. And so everybody feels, you know, good that what they're doing actually has like some kind of purpose serving some kind of objective for the team, all that kind of good stuff. Everybody, you can imagine like, you know, one of these diagrams for like every single one person, of your, uh, person on your team where everybody has like their own little piece of work that they have and that context is kind of like that unit that sur uh, surrounds everybody and gets everybody to, you know, work together. Now I'm using, you know, this context word uh, pretty loosely right now. So we're going to kind of like get into uh, the meat of what that meant, at least in the next big sound. I think the important thing, of course, to keep in mind here is that there's no such thing as like a one size fits all silver bullet solution here to like any kind of product uh, uh, team challenge. Uh, you know, creating context is, of course, in itself like super contextual, right? It depends a lot on who your team is. Uh, at next big sound, like we were a really achievement-driven, super kind, you know, work hard kind of team. But we also had a lot of problems with like uh, conflict and actually like surfacing some kind of tensions and talking them through, right? So some of the tools that we had kind of like built around playing to those strengths and also trying to, you know, address those weaknesses. You know, you might have a team of your own that maybe like gets along great, has a lot of great ideas, but maybe doesn't always like do a good job of um, getting down uh, into the nitty gritty and actually shipping. Or you might have the opposite problem. You might have a team that is super good at shipping, but like doesn't really communicate at all well. You know, they like to do their work, but the, uh, the connection between that work kind of like falls apart. Uh, also, like it's really contextual based on who you are ultimately as a product lead. Like doing that kind of work is really pretty personal and it throws into relief. Uh, really starkly like what your strengths are typically and then what some of your weaknesses are. So you might be again somebody who does 
uh, great at like jokes and positivity, but you know maybe not be so great at conflict. You might again be the opposite. Like these habits, you know, that I'm going to talk about in terms of context are really there to help you know bring all those things together and bridge you know all the work and all the characteristics of yourself and your team, and you know get some good work done. You guys ready to get going? Yeah. Cool. Here we go. Uh, first, I'll talk about kind of like the what. Some of these words can be, if you Google them and try to get some kind of definition, you'd probably get a thousand different definitions. Like mission is a pretty loose word sometimes. Vision is a pretty loose word sometimes. Even a lot of people like abuse the word strategy. Goals can mean whatever they mean to different people, right? The point I'm trying to make, or at least what I want to share with you two all tonight, is just like what it meant for Next Big Sound. And maybe those ideas will be helpful for y'all. So I'll go through them and talk about what they meant for Next Big Sound. Uh, mission. So at Next Big Sound, uh, the mission that we always had was making data useful. That was the kind of like guiding light for the Next Big Sound team since the beginning of Next Big Sound time, which was 2009, I think. Uh, this is kind of like the holy incantation that we might uh, repeat at the beginning of like every uh, weekly team meeting. Um, we joked about and almost got to saying it together in unison, but we thought that it just got a little too culty. But the important thing is, is to have that kind of like fervent belief in some kind of like distant, fantastic, exciting objective. And for us, it was making data useful. Now, as we kind of like matured and find, found a product market fit, we got acquired by Pandora, the kind of like, you know, width that you could take from something like making data useful got narrower and narrower and narrower. And I think that, you know, might have been kind of an opportunity to try to like make that a little more specific because although this is like super great mission, kind of like if you are an early stage startup and you're looking for product market fit, like, you know, there are three really powerful words, like making, you're actually doing something, data, we're specifically working with data, we're not working with so much qualitative information, and then useful, there's a promise there that it's going to benefit some kind of a user, right? But by the time that we were part of Pandora, I think maybe a mission kind of around like making data useful for musicians, right, might have been a little bit more meaningful, or making data useful for band managers, you know? Um, again, like, what this needs to be is like really contextual based on kind of like where you're at, where your team's at, where your product's at, all the good stuff. But at the end of the day, like some kind of mission should be something that like every team member knows by heart, it's repeated over and over again, and is inspiring and exciting and like has some kind of promise that people want to work on. Cool. Uh, next up, strategy. So we've got this mission, we've got some kind of objective that we're going after. Uh, how are we going to get there? The guiding light we had was always kind of climbing the data pyramid. Now, this is kind of like a mental model uh, that was helpful for the whole team to kind of like have in mind. Um, and really great to like reference, say, around like quarterly product plan project planning, that sort of thing. And I'll show you what this means, because of course it means nothing uh, to you and you've seen it. Um, so two next big sound, first layer of the pyramid is a data asset, right? So for eight years, Nine years, how many ever years, uh, we were collecting all of the like social data, all of the streaming data, and all the event data that we could for any band or artist that we could get our hands on. Um, this year we got somewhere over 500,000 artists, probably more. Um, there are a lot of musicians out there, as it turns out. And updating social data on a daily basis, it turns out there's a lot of data down there. And simply like bringing it together, having it in one place and making sure that's clean, that's quality and you can depend on it, that's an enormous task in and of itself. And anything you want to build on top of it doesn't mean anything really. It all falls apart unless you have you know, this kind of data layer at the bottom that's uh, secure. So this is something we could always come back to like when we were talking about like either what we were going to do or how well something had worked or how something had kind of gone off the rails, right? We've got this mental model in terms of our strategy that we can kind of like think about, reference together as one team, you know, some kind of context, what we're working on. It helps kind of like work together, communicate, understand where we're going. 
On top of data, we have the information layer. So like if I have you know account for Kanye West Twitter followers, updates every day, do some very, very simple math, and I can tell you the change right day to day. I do some more simple math, and I can do a percent change day to day, right? Um, again, you can't do that kind of stuff unless you have a data layer, but that kind of information built on top of the data, more useful for users. And then finally, you know, the golden objective that we always were trying to reach for was something called, we call insights internally. Think of that as something like, if I have a percentage change for Kanye West every day, and one day that percentage change goes up, now I have something kind of like go at, I can look at what kind of events happened around that date, and I might be able to have some kind of insight like, hey Kanye, when you played that show in Chicago, and you lost your damn mind and you walked off stage crying or whatever, um, that was actually really good for your Twitter followers. So, I mean, you can't do that too many times, but hey, you know, maybe there's something to learn there, Kanye. Um, the, the important thing here, right, is that, you know, we have this kind of like image, you know, a path, you know, something that kind of like built toward something in uh, steps that helped the team kind of come back to something in terms of strategy. The data pyramid has always been kind of a core vision since before my time at the company. So I don't know if there's anything that kind of like preceded that. But definitely when I started, Next Big Sound was still an independent company. And I was brought on actually when the team was trying to move into a different vertical entirely. There's actually a Next Big Book for about a year. We also were trying really hard to sell to brands for a while, right? Uh, a lot of things I did in the first year was put together these like 10 page reports about you know, Pepsi, and like here are 10 artists you might want to work with for X, Y, Z reason. Like we were still trying to find product market fit before the Pandora acquisition. So definitely like, you know, every three to six months would be some kind of new thing we were trying to, trying to try to keep the lights on and keep the money coming in. Within those goals, then we'd have like discrete projects. You know, and a project would be something that had a clear beginning and a clear ending. And if we were so committed as to take on a project, we would always finish it unless like something, we had some like dramatic new information that told us we need to move on and not take care of it, right? Uh, the two big like projects, right, that we had in 2017 were working on a data center migration. Um, the other one was all the way at the top, which was actually creating like email alerts um, for artists. If you like, again, like subscribe to Kanye, you would get an email that just says, hey, Kanye had a big spike in Twitter. Here are some events that are around it. You go check it out. Pretty simple um, concept. Of course, the work is not nearly as simple, um, but it's incredibly useful. Uh, instead of having to like go into a product and like pull the information, you just get it pushed to the user. You know, it's automatic. You don't have to know to look for something. It just kind of shows up. So, like that's to me like what could be more useful than just something that tells me. Uh, what uh, what I want to look for, right? Tell me I'm gonna look at it. Uh, finally, uh, we always had metrics. Uh, metrics are tough, especially for a team that isn't uh, making money anymore. When we got bought by Pandora, um, our service was kind of like offered to the big labels as kind of like a, a fig leaf, I guess. You know, two three years ago, Pandora and the music industry didn't really like get along that well. Um, and our acquisition was actually a big part of like trying to make amends. And this was always a topic of some, uh, some discussion. And we clutched together, you know, one metric because I, we all felt very strongly that having at least just one metric was table stakes, right? Something that we could all focus on, all think about, and all try to like get all of our projects and any of our goals and any of our strategy and the mission really should drive like some kind of increase in insight consumed. Uh, for us, we, had an imperfect thing here with Insight Consumed, but I think it was still very useful. Like we would put together page views, plus API calls, plus emails uh, opened. You know, like we want to have some kind of metric that always indicated that you, our users were engaging with our data in some way. So like met, uh, emails sent, who cares? You know, you can send 100,000 emails, nobody opens them, it doesn't matter, right? So we had you know, it wasn't weighted or anything, and maybe it like undercounts page views and overcounts API, and we definitely had these discussions um, to try to like fine tune things, but it makes it more complicated. It's a it's a big thing, right? To try to like get a core metric for a business together, and we ultimately had this one. 
look at it every day, look at it every week for the whole team, look at it all the time uh, to make sure that it's going the right way. Uh, I think two years ago, like it was the goal for the year was to like double insights consumed, you know, and that was kind of like the railing cry we had for 2016. That was what, you know, the whole team, you know, came around, got excited about, and then when we debate like, okay, if that is our shared goal, you know, then to move this metric, what kind of project should we do? You know, it's again like creating all this context, all these like layers of information that everybody knows and hears it over and over again that helps people have like really effective communication so they can like work together, know what their work is doing, all that good stuff. Um, you know, daily we have stand ups. Stand ups are not like a new idea anymore. Um, I remember when they were to me and I was like, this is great. Um, I've been at one or two other places that were doing stand ups and I couldn't believe it. Uh, it's really difficult. Uh, it's always amazing to kind of see the journey from the initial resistance to having to stand up and talk every day to the breakthrough when suddenly everybody just like starts talking about all their problems all of a sudden. And then in a couple you know weeks suddenly things are humming along a lot better. It's almost like talking a little bit every day is useful. So um, I'm a big I'm a big advocate stand ups. You know, quick as possible, short and sweet. Mostly focused around like blockers of dependency, like that's really what a standup should be about. Uh, weekly, we always had a full team meeting uh, every Friday morning, ten o'clock. Uh, called it bagels. Always had bagels. Um, Alex, the CT, uh, CEO, would always start every meeting by saying, "Sup, guys. You know, welcome to another week in making data useful." You know, like I said, the incantation that we'd repeat over and over again, um, and then we would review the goals for the year and just repeat them, you know, play them back to everybody. And then we get project updates from all the project leads to see how things were going. Every Friday, week after week after week after week, touching base with the whole team all at once on a Friday morning. Um, whether it's Monday morning, whether it's Tuesday night, you know, whenever. Um, I can't imagine a team not having some kind of like all hands on deck meeting on a week to week basis, especially if you're a smaller team. I have to imagine that gets exceptionally difficult uh, when you get much larger. I know that Pandora had full hand meetings like once a month. You know, um, you hit that limit of like 80 people. It's probably very difficult to actually make that feel like everybody coming together and communicating with one another. So, you know, this is good advice for a smaller company, I think. but. Um, the first things we always did in those meetings was talk about some of this contextual stuff, right? Like that was the core of the meeting, the first thing that got said. And we might get into like industry news or talking about Kanye and how he lost his mind and have some fun or watch a video, like whatever. But the context was always what was important. Uh, Bi-weekly, we did, you know, sprints, you know, two-week sprints. Um, and again, this would be like usually Wednesday morning, we would look at the metrics, see how the metrics have moved in the past two weeks, if we'd shipped anything, see if there was a bump, was the bump as much as we expected, was it higher, was it lower, why, have a discussion about it. We talk about what the different projects had accomplished in the past week. Uh, we talk about what people plan on doing for the next two weeks for those projects. And uh, something that I always did, you know, somebody who's like leading those meetings was anytime somebody talked about something they worked on, tie it back to you know, those goals for you or tie it back to making data useful. You know, like even if it's a little kludgy sometimes, like pointing out that every little bit of work that somebody shipped has something to do with what we're working on, like reinforcing that over and over again, super helpful, super helpful. Uh, quarterly, we did project planning. So we would sit down, look at the past quarter, see how the projects have gone, have we moved the metrics, so we're feeling good, and talk about what we want to do for uh, the next quarter, right? This would be a exercise that the whole team participated in. The whole team would kind of suggest projects that we might do. The whole team would discuss which projects they thought they, we should do, advocate for them. And we wouldn't decide, you know, through consensus or anything, but everybody had their share in a really like transparent process, right? And again, the way to argue for what projects you want to do for that quarter, what you think the team should do, of course, is going back to that context and saying, this helps us meet our goals, this helps us climb the data pyramid, this helps us get to our mission.
and like finally annually we would reset those goals, right? So as I kind of said, like last year we had a goal that was based on the metrics, you know. This year the goals are based around the data pyramid. You might do something different. Like two years ago it was make next big sound simpler and smarter. So anything we did had to be justified in terms of making things simple or smarter, which was probably a little too loosey-goosey to be totally honest, because <laughs> those words aren't very specific. <laughs>